entrepreneurs and professionals of Tampa Bay. Welcome to your hour for getting the information, the tools, and the connections for elevating your business. Welcome to Getting the Edge with Kelly Wilson. And here's your host, Kelly Wilson. Welcome to Getting the Edge. Uh, I'm your host, Kelly Wilson. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Excited to be back in the studios uh, with brand new episodes uh, to get the edge with leading uh, business owners and community leaders in our community. We want to promote and highlight everyone's businesses, but our real niche here is sharing stories. So uh, we look forward to being with you each and every week uh, to to share stories. I'm, I'm a firm believer that we can learn so much from each other. So that is exactly what we're here to do. Uh, Getting the Edge is a product of Edge Business Community and Magazine. Uh, Check out our website at edgebusinessmagazine.com. Really excited about our new magazine issue that's launching soon. We're just about ready to uh, to get it ready to go. It's uh, February 5th is actually our upcoming launch. We've got a great launch celebration planned. Definitely come out, get tickets, come out and enjoy. Uh, We've got uh, great uh, DJ entertainment. Uh, We're focusing on 10 and highlighting 10 not-for-profit leaders in our community. Uh, Just a great group of individuals. Again, more website, uh, more information is on the website, but definitely come out. We, uh, after seven years of of throwing parties in the community, uh, we definitely know how to do it, and uh, it's a great time. And uh, I think we have up to $2,500 in raffle prizes. Uh, It's just a really great night and great people. So I definitely recommend you come out and and celebrate the new issue issue with us. It's all about nonprofit communities, uh, organizations, and the amazing dynamic individuals uh, that let lead them. So again, really excited about the upcoming issue. You can uh, subscribe on our website and never miss any future copies. And uh, mentioning uh, the mention of website uh, reminds me that we do have a brand new website launching soon. Hopefully, uh, we'll have that launched uh, by the end of February. And again, uh, just uh, state of the art and really looking looking forward to launching that soon. So stay tuned for all the exciting new updates uh, as as they come available. So really excited again to be here today in the studio with you. would love to thank our sponsors. love to thank uh, All Trust Insurance uh, for being one of our new sponsors of the Edge Business uh, Community and Magazine, as well as Pilot Bank. Uh, and if you are looking in this new year and you're interested in having your own show, similar to Getting the Edge, definitely check out uh, the amazing John Gaston and his team at Tampa Bay Multimedia. Uh, check out WeBeam TV and uh, definitely look into all the other shows. Consider having your own show and, and creating your own platform forum to share your message. Uh, definitely, that we are, Edge is now, I think, in our year, year and a half, uh, in our transitioned uh, visual pod vision, as John would say it. Uh, but prior to that, we were on the radio for years. It's been a great outlet for us, a great platform uh, to promote, again, um, amazing people in our community that are doing uh, amazing things. So uh, again, happy to be here with you today. I've got a great guest, really excited to share his story uh, and, and learn more about, about him. So in the studio, I'd love to introduce with us. Uh, Jimmy Giles is here with us today. Jimmy is a business owner and a retired uh, NFL player, one of the um, uh, Ring of Honor member uh, from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which yeah. I know is quite an honor. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, doing some research and uh, getting ready for Jimmy's show. It was just uh, so many years of uh, playing professionally and just I'm, I'm, there's so much I, I'm sure that you're going to be able to share with us and just lessons learned and things you've been through. So uh, again, pleasure to have you. Thank you for being here. And it's certainly a pleasure to be here. I've had an opportunity to look at a couple of your shows and they are really awesome. <laughs> I appreciate that. So I hope that. I can you. follow in that same footstep <laughs> of giving a decent Well, show. I'd love to say a thank you to Rita Lohman, Pilot Bank, who's one of our uh, sponsors for the community and the magazine and the show. And uh, she definitely recommended that that I should have you on. And I, I'm thankful to her for the recommendation. Listen, Rita is one of my favorite. <laughs> and I always say, when I grow up, I want to be just like yeah, her. Yeah, you she and me both. She's a really a yeah. dynamic person. And um, she has a lot of people that she's uh, mentored and Absolutely. she's mentoring my daughter, which is uh, runs our company actually. And uh, it's just always exciting to be around her and speak yeah. with her. She is quite the inspiration and quite, quite the role model uh, for young of young women uh, throughout the community. I mean, men as well. Men. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, she she's yeah. definitely is a role model for us all. So uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Rita. Appreciate your support with the community. So tell us a little bit. I, I want to go back into your your story and just how in growing up and, and everything you've kind of been through and how, you know, getting you to where you are today. But tell me a little bit about uh, the Giles uh, Insurance Company now and uh, tell us a little bit about that, where you are today. 
Well, I tell you, I'll say the the long, boring part for, <laughs> for the book that um, we're currently trying yeah, to. Yeah, I, I uh, said put he's, he's going to include teasers throughout throughout the show, but he doesn't have to tell the whole book. We, we only have fifty six minutes yeah. total, so. Well, actually, you know, when I started playing professional football, it wasn't like it is today. Um, most of these guys are making large six figures. Back in those days, if we made a good five figures, we were in pretty good company. So we had to do something to supplement our salaries during the course of uh, the remaining of the year doing football. And you had to be very frugal with your money and to make sure you saved and was, was prepared for the all season. So I s decided to become an insurance agent and I worked very hard to um, um, learn all the aspects of the insurance business and I was fortunate um, to get my Series 6, 63 and Series 7 license during the early part of my football career which I knew would enable me to have a successful and profitable life mm -hmm. after football because we just weren't making the salaries that these guys are making now. Yeah, that's interesting that you would think that you would need another uh, another career. We're I, I would think that the conception is that oh they're in f they're in they're in a, in the NFL now. That's it. And I think so many people don't even think about the future even beyond that because the the like uh, the livelihood of, you know, your career life isn't that long in in that. Right. And and my my mom and my dad they always talked about the future and they prepared us to think about the future. And that's one of the things that I'm so proud of because I tried to carry that legacy over to my kids, always prepare for the next day or the next year. Right. And that's what we did. People, Thankfully, most people yeah. are shocked when I when they tell when I tell them that my first year I only made thirty two thousand dollars. So nineteen seventy seven. Nineteen seventy seven. Yeah. And as a third round draft choice, I got a thirty thousand dollar bonus and a thirty two thousand dollar salary as a third round draft choice with the Houston Oilers. And I've talked to some of my friends that were insurance agents at the time, and most of them said, "Man, I made more than that in one year," and that was back in seventy seven. And then, and not only did you have like such a rigorous schedule, obviously, but it, it, it's it's a tough it's a, it's a tough sport, which I want to talk a little bit about that as well. But um, yeah, but if you think about all the salaries were quite a bit less, I guess, in that time, right? right. So that that was probably a decent amount of money. But well, not compared to some well, of your it, insurance it buddies. It actually but was a good amount of money if you plan well, because. We actually lived two lives during that time. You you had to live the life of a football player, which you had a family, your home, and then once you, uh, the season was over, you got to become a father, a husband. You have to go out and find uh, opportunities to make money, which is what I did with the insurance business, and that's when I studied to make sure that I was uh, going to be a very productive citizen after football because. You got to remember the lifespan of a football player was only three and a half years. Oh, yeah. Well, so I you were realize. only going to make that money for three, four years, and there are a lot of guys that are in that position to this day still only make it through the league. I think the average lifespan is about three years. So you have to prepare, and that's one of the things that we did. And when I say we, I'm talking about me and my wife because we did plan well throughout those years. And so, uh, so how many years? So you started in '77, and then who, who did you start with? Well, where are you originally from? Uh, I'm originally from uh, Greenville, Mississippi. That's where I was born and raised. Um, played football and baseball in high school. I was actually a baseball player more so than a football. Is player. that right? Yeah, and I actually had an, uh, um, a scholarship when I. Uh, uh, completed high school. We were the state champions in, in, in Mississippi at Greenville High School. And I got an offer to Michigan to play in Michigan. Uh, fortunately, I didn't go <laughs> because my high school year, I think it was around March or April of my senior year, I met this young lady, which was introduced to me by a mail carrier, our mail carrier. And it just happens the mail carrier, that was his sister. Vivian? Vivian. Okay, your wife today. My wife today. <laughs> okay. And he asked me if I knew her, and I told him I don't, didn't really know her, but fortunately when he told me her name, and I went to my buddy and said, hey, who is this Vivian? Uh, Vivian Davis. And they called me Tip back in those days, because I used to run on my toes and still did when <laughs> I played. But 
My friend and I was walking down the hall one day, and he said, Tip, there she is. And that was the lady that I had been watching. So it just gave me an opportunity to approach her and uh, so introduce myself. So how, how myself. many years have you been together now? Oh, uh, my gosh. 44 years oh my goodness. in July 3rd. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So then, so, and then you're, and you had originally got drafted or went to college. Where did you go with the scholarship then? Or I, I, who'd you? Actually, when I met Vivian, Vivian was, you know, she was one of those people that were really smart. So she had an academic scholarship to Alcorn State University. And something told me, don't let this lady get away. Mm -hmm. So I changed my mind and I was a walk on in baseball. Uh, at Alcorn State University. So I gave up a scholarship in Michigan and went to Alcorn as a walk-on playing baseball. So then how did football come back into your life? Football came back into my life because, and this was actually four years later, when uh, Alcorn State University and Gramlin, which is the school Doug Williams went to, we were the first college, first college teams to play in the Louisiana Superdome. At that time, the Louisiana uh, Superdome was the seventh wonder of the world, or eighth wonder of the world. And man, when they said Alcorn and Gramlin was gonna play, for some reason, I jumped up and said, I'm playing in that game. And not only did I fulfill my thoughts, but I played and I starred in the game and I eventually met this guy named Doug Williams. Never knew that much about uh, that we would meet somewhere else but lo and behold, uh, after I played in the game, it was two years later, I got traded to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and we drafted Doug Williams with the first pick. Oh, so that's draft. nice. So we were able to connect like that. And we've been friends since that day because of that connection, mm -hmm. being the first college team to play in the Louisiana Superdome. And for some reason, that connection has been there, and we've been friends for 44 years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so how many years then, so you're with the Bucks, and then did you went somewhere after the Bucks? Yeah, I played with the Bucks for nine years. So that is, you were quite the exception as far as how many years you actually played then in the NFL compared to what your typical time is. Absolutely. How many years total then did I you play? I played 13 years in the league. Wow. One of the things that you have to do, first of all, you have to take it very seriously. Um, you have to train, um, you have to make sure that your body is in shape, you never get out of shape. But I remember um, a gentleman by the name of Tommy John, he was a scout uh, in the National Football League. He told me, Jimmy, when you play your first season, he told me that I was gonna be playing when he came and scouted me. He said, but what I want you to do is make sure that you take three months off and let your body heal every year. And I always did that for 13 years. Do you think they do that today? I don't know, but if I was advising a young man, I would tell him let his body heal. And you can, you, can re, you can relate to that because look at the injuries mm -hmm. when certain players have injuries now. Like, and the one that I can think of off my head is Kevin Durant. It took him a year to recover from that injury. The other kid from uh, the Golden State Warriors, it's taken him up from Achilles. It takes you almost a year, at least a year to heal. And when you go through that kind of punishment, day in and day out, you mm -hmm. have to let your body heal from all of that. I, I can't even imagine. I had a, my son played from the time he was five mm -hmm. and you know, to the TBYFL all the way up uh, and, and decided the senior year he didn't want to play anymore. But as a mom, you know, watching your son as a little, little guy and then even growing up into, into high school, it, it, it's, you know, it just scares you. It's, Scared. Well, I think for young boys, a lot of times it's a rite of passage because they're trying to impress a girl. And in fact, you know, that's what I did. I was trying <laughs> to impress my wife because I wanted to play football. Mm -hmm. you know? And that, pretty much that's what inspired me to play in the Superdome and impress um, my wife, or ex at that time it was my girlfriend. And I wanted to be successful. And when I put my mind to something, I want to make sure that I achieve at it. So what were some, and that's great advice uh, still today, what, what is uh, some of the bigger games that you've been a part of and played in? I know um, there was, and I, as many years as I've been talking and, and had a you know, son and different things mm -hmm. in football, I should know a lot more. But you know, it's, it's interesting when you read your stats, I think that is what they call it. And you, know, you kind of go through, you were involved in, and they talk about different games and, and three touchdowns and just different things. Is there one game well, that you actually, look back at? Well, actually, the biggest game 
game that I played in was actually a team effort because back in 1976, 76, you know, the Bucks, they were like 0 oh, and 24, and then they won um, in 77. They won the last two games of the season. They beat the New Orleans Saints and the St. Louis Cardinals. So the Bucks were called perennial losers at that time. But after three years with myself, Doug Williams, Ricky Bell, Leroy Selman, Richard Wood, David Lewis, Dewey Selman, um, I mean, we just knew that we were going to have a, a team that was cohesive because we all did things together. Um, we wanted to make sure that we changed the concept of being what everybody else was called losers. And the third year in 1979, when we beat the Kansas City Chief to get in the playoffs, that was really the most important game that I've ever played in until this day. And I played into some big games. But to get that, as they call, the monkey off your back so people will respect mm -hmm. you. And that was one of the biggest games because we were no longer losers. We were winners. We won the division. You kind of gained we, that respect then. We from. gained and, and we earned it because we had the best defense and we had a very explosive offense with, with the guys we had in Ricky Bell, Doug William, Eckwood, myself. Um, we could score at any time. And I always re remember Steve Wilson would always say when we are in the game, if we got Doug Williams back there, we can always win. You know, it's, it's, there's so many different pieces of the puzzle kind of coming together in order to make a successful team or make a successful business for that matter. So uh, what are some, in your, you know, looking back, on, you know, having those different, like the tight end, mm -hmm. you know, in different positions, or again, kind of even thinking of it like a business and having all these different parts, what are some different strategies on like bringing all these pieces to just work like clockwork in a sense to where it's almost you know like a rhythm Kelly, that's a great question and I, I tell you what one of the things that we do as a as a company as a insurance adjusting company we consider ourselves uh, the best in the business um, it took us a number of years to get into a company um, and citizens insurance is one of our main clients but one of the things that we uh, do, and my wife came up with this um, saying, we hire good people and we treat them like family. And that was a football metaphor that we used back in 79. When you have a team and everybody is together and you treat each other like family, you respect mm -hmm. each other, and you do the same, you take that same mantra and you put it into a business. You treat people with respect, you pay them well, you're going to get good results. And I also model that because in the years that have since passed, I saw uh, Trevor Burgess do it and Reed, Rita Loman when, when I was fortunate enough to be with them with C1. They did the same thing. They hired good people. They treated them like family. They paid them well. Mm -hmm. um, they, Trevor was, C1 Bank was one of the first banks to pay all of his employees a living wage, um, and That's everybody was well living respected. Wage versus yeah. a minimum or a yeah, living absolutely. wage, I like absolutely. that. Absolutely, it made a big difference in how people felt, your attitude about coming to work. They do the little things a lot better because mm -hmm. you know you're going to do the big things right because it's going to be so evident. But when you do the little things well, that's what people respect more. Yeah, I, I would think that all of those years being a team player, you know, has really helped formulate that and kind of strategize as a, as a business owner because you really, uh, I'm so fortunate to sit down and interview great people like yourself. And it's, as, as everyone shares their story, you really see pieces of the puzzle coming together. You can take bits of pieces from your entire life and kind of help and, it, you know, we can, you can store away what you don't need, but, right, what, what, right. but what you can use, you know, it, it, it really works. Going back to just some of the things when you, 13 years playing NFL and you know, again, three and a half years being tip your, you know, your average, right. I know you've taken, you know, it, it's taken a toll on you over the years and, and kind of what you tell me, tell us a little bit about what you've experienced well, actually, or when well, did you start to experience even taking three you know, months off? Certain things now they know a lot of things or things have come out over the years that we kind of took for granted. Uh, we didn't really know what was happening. You know, little things like um, driving around, and if you stop at a stoplight, you just kind of like, 
where am I? That happens a number of times to a number of players. And until we all years back start discussing this thing in our meetings that we had, oh, did you have that same experience? I imagine nobody wanted it. It's kind of like some, you know, an unspoken. Exactly. Nobody wanted to talk about it um, until one day a guy was just, we were just talking casually. And he said, man, I couldn't remember where I was. And I said, that happened to you? Well, it happened to me too. And then this is where all these things with the NFL started, um, came about. And I got to say, um, with a lot of reluctancy, I think the NFL, they did step up and they start, they looked at the situation, and they came to an ag agreement, and a lot of the players are being compensated and taken care of medically because of those kind of issues, which have led them to the protocols that they have in place now. Um, the, and they call them the concussion pro protocols when a guy get hit extremely hard and he seems like he's dazed, he has to come out the game and he has to get checked out. So you got to applaud them for some of the things that they're doing now to make the game a lot safer and better. Do you think they've implemented any type of break or rest time like in the off season? Because it doesn't seem like, it, I don't know, you watch the news or you just clips of things, they're always in training, right? And some of the young players, they always – because the, you know, the next guy can come by and be better, right? Well, I, I mean, think so they have It's now. such a competitive. You, you are absolutely right. They have implemented rules where you have to take a certain amount of time off, particularly when you get injured, um, whereas before we wanted to try to get back as soon as uh, possible. But I was fortunate enough to have advice from older people who had played years prior to me, and I took advantage of what they, of what they had um, you know, told me in life is to take the time off, let your body heal. And for the most part, most of the teams are doing that now. But they do come back, I think, around April and start mm -hmm. training programs. And well, you definitely had a good upbringing because you, unlike I think many, you, you actually listen to kind of what other, your elders and what other people are kind of saying, save money or or even have another career, you know, work work with something else. You know, it's so many people I think don't take the advice of, of what, what those that have already been there, you know, maybe not necessarily as an NFL player, but just. No, I'm not saying it always worked. True, true. <laughs> but I did listen. Right. I tried to take advantage of some of the things. I've had my days where things didn't go well. We all, you of have, course. Yeah, you have issues. Of course. And, you know, by the grace of God, you have people that step up in your life that give you great advice. Um, and if you listen and you learn from your mistakes, you'll be extremely successful from that. One of the questions I always ask when I have the pleasure of, of doing the interviews is what is the best advice you've ever been given? Did somebody, and you've kind of shared some already, but is, is there something that someone said once that we haven't mentioned that, that really has stood out to you? Well, I think for the most part, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier about just letting your body rest and make sure you're mentally prepared when you go in, um, when you go into the next season. And that allowed me, by, by taking that advice, it allowed me to play 13 years. And my body told me when I had to retire, I mean, in my 13th year, um, I ran a 66-yard touchdown back on with uh, the Philadelphia Eagles against the Denver Broncos on a Sunday. Well, that next day, I could hardly walk because, <laughs> you know, it was just a tough situation being in the league that long. And once I got my hand on the football, I really wanted to score. And I think. So did you feel it at the moment with the ball? Like no, nah, you you're so into what you're doing. Right. Yeah, the adrenaline is pumping so fast. You know, you really don't feel any pain doing. But afterwards, you do. And um, I think the best advice that I've ever ever taken is from um, Mr. Tommy John, and he just told me to make sure you, from a football perspective, mm. um, I've had other advice from people from a financial end on how to. Um, you know, prepare for the future, and I've taken that advice to heart. What there was, uh, you know, there's so many different things I want to ask. One, what advice can you give to? You know, I think being that the lifespan is so short in the NFL, it's you know, different people I've known over the years. It just seems like a lot of times they struggle once they're not in that NFL, because uh, that's it. I know even with our careers in life, mm -hmm. what we do kind of defines who we are. We have to 
know who we are beyond that, whether we're a, a, a wife or a mother or a husband or a, 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 a father. So how do you, like, what advice, or did anyone share anything with you, like how to move on past that, or, or how to move on to the next chapter of well, your life? Well, one of the, some of the advice that I got uh, in my early years is never think you're successful in life until you're able to give back in life. Mm -hmm. and I like that. I've always worked hard. My family knows that. And as I mentioned earlier, my daughter actually runs our company now along with my two sons. But until we were able to build our foundation, which is the Jimmy and Vivian Giles Family Foundation, and we were able to give back to uh, the elementary school that we're part of, that's when you feel like you're making accomplishments right. in life and you're, you're very successful. And. Um, we're so fortunate that, you know, when you see these third and fourth and fifth graders involved in projects that you help implement, it's really amazing to see how their eyes light up. And these kids are extremely brilliant. You know, you put a computer in front of them, you put the uh, building blocks in front of them, and they make robots talk and walk and say things and do things. It's really amazing. Oh, well, thank you yeah. for that and, and all of your contributions to the community. I think you're right. I think we're, it's more about what we can give back and what right. we can do for others. And, and that's definitely helps us adjust. And, and, and just to, I think that's when you know you've made it yeah. is when, yeah. when you can truly give back. Going through and just thinking about all the different things that you've been through, uh, there was one article that I, or a quote that I read that you said that you had an opportunity prior to the NFL, like to work for Sears or to go into mm -hmm. something else. And, and you'd wished maybe you had gone that route. You'd probably be in a lot less pain today. So what, what are your thoughts well, on I that? Well, I know I would have been in a <laughs> lot less pain. <laughs> but when I was, I was, my actual goals when I first uh, went to college, I really wanted to be a lawyer. And I think my dad kind of held that against me because, <laughs> you know, he wasn't a big football fan. He believed in working hard, but he was really proud and excited about us. But I had an opportunity um, when we had the college, the businesses would come in and recruit college students. And I was fortunate enough to be recruited by Sears to become a manager and they flew myself uh, and my uh, fiance at the time, Vivian, uh, to Memphis, Tennessee to uh, interview as a manager. And uh, at the same time of the interview, I had a tryout uh, the next day with one of the scouts of the National Football League. So you, I had to be in Memphis one day and two days later I had to be back in school to go through this tryout. But, you know, things happen for a reason. They do. I had the offer in hand as a, as a manager with Sears. And when you get an opportunity to play in the National Football League, you don't turn it down. Yeah, it's a once so, in a lifetime, yeah. uh, you know. And it was something that offer. I enjoyed doing and Typically. I knew I could do well. Right. So, so, so ultimately no regrets. No, no, yeah. not really. And I said that um, because, you know, you think about things and, I, I have friends that are all state agents now that are extremely successful and they don't hurt like I do. <laughs> and plus they beat me on the golf course, so that's why I'd probably say that right, at the time. Right. But it's, it's a lot of fun. But we were blessed. We were blessed to, um, as I said, when I retired from football, you know, we, I became an all state insurance agent uh, and actually became a financial advisor with all state. Um, and with my licenses that I had, we were responsible for. Um, the finances of a number of people insuring their homes, their cars, their money, and um, we made sure that we got them to the right people so they could uh, benefit from our services. Um, and then after that, um, one day I was sitting in my office and I was talking to this lady, we were talking about insurance and finances, and I just went blank. Like on the phone or like? No, oh, I was, she, she oh. was right there. I mean, and I couldn't remember what I was doing. Or, and I got up and walked out and I saw my wife. And I asked her, what am I doing here? I couldn't remember anything. And that's, that was years ago, but I can remember it really vividly. How long does that last? It was short term. It I mean, just, like just like a minute it, it or was, a, um, uh, 30 like, seconds? Like or then a you're... couple of minutes you, till you get up and you just like, um, 
you know, you move around and you say, try to find something that's familiar It'll trigger to trigger kind of. And that's the same thing happened to me when I was driving one day and, you know, some of the guys were talking about it. Um, you just try to figure out, well, what am I doing? Where am I? And kind of re- re- back step, like, yeah. okay, what, what, in Absolutely. kind of leading up to. But, you know, I've done that because as, when I trained, um, I was trained to be an Allstate agent and back in the day, this was 1992 when this happened, during this time that this happened. Um, as training to be an agent, um, we were, I was training to be an Allstate insurance adjuster. And you travel to a lot of different cities. So at some point, all of them become similar. And if you can remember this commercial, I'm not sure, I think it was a, Southwest Airline commercial. Um, the guy said, thank you, Detroit. And he's in <laughs> Cleveland, he was a singer. Uh, you remember that one? Yeah. Well, it was like that, and I, I related to that commercial because you could be in one city and think you're in another city. Right. And so it just happens that fast and you just have to stop, take a deep breath and see exactly where you are. Yeah. So going back to kind of, we talked a little bit about some of the struggles that, that you've had, just as far as from a, almost a political standpoint, the politics involved in building a business and kind of uh, partnering oh, with certain types of insurance companies. And, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the struggles that you've been through. And we specifically, we talked about citizens, insurance, and just some insurance is just, it, it's a hard there's just so many issues around that. I, I spent uh, over a decade in real estate years ago, and I just as uh, retired now for many years. But it, there was always kind of a problem there. And as as uh, as as our I think, what did it happen? Like oh four probably too when we had those hurricanes that yes, came through. Yes, oh four and oh five. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, then nobody wanted to insure do any homeowners insurance. Right. So there were so many. And a lot of companies wanted to pull out. I know State Farm wanted to pull out, and they, there was they a, were the largest at, yeah. in, at that time in the state. There was a while that Citizens was the only option. Exactly, exactly. Well, one of the things that happened to us, um, after being an Allstate agent for about nine and a half years, I parlayed that into a insurance adjuster. And even starting in 2001, um, we had started the company. We just parlayed our insurance company into an insurance adjusting company. And we had the experience, we had the adjusters, because my wife, my daughter, my sons, all of them, I brought them all into the business. They were all very well qualified. And we would, at the beginning of the year, um, citizens would have what they call um, our um, request for proposals and you would submit your proposal to them. Every year they would have some kind of proposal. Every year we would submit a response to those proposals. Every year when we ask <laughs> about those proposals they didn't, they come up missing, they didn't have them, something was going on. It took us 13 years to get an off opportunity to step foot or present our proposal to citizens. And one of the reasons we were able to do that is because when I was with C1 Bank as an advisor, and that's when Rita was still there, and they had been as, as helpful as they possibly could, um, Rick Scott, the former governor, he came and introduced himself to us. Mm -hmm. And I, I just couldn't help myself. I just <laughs> you had got, an opportunity yeah, you were going for. Yeah, it was for. there, and I, I mean, I'm not shy about it. So I got up and I, I told him, I said, Governor Scott, uh, I'd like to talk to you uh, about a situation with citizens. I said, for a number of years, we've submitted proposals to them and they all, all the time they get lost, stolen, they never heard of us or whatever. I said, I would like an opportunity to just sit down and talk to you about it. And fortunately, um, he called his chief of staff over, he gave me his card, he put his number on it, and in two weeks I was sitting in his office. Wow. And what he did, I mean, that's just perseverance because this was 13 right. years from the first right. time that we started this. Um, what he did, he, he called us up. We went, me and my two sons, we went and had a meeting with him. Um, we met with his chief of staff and he appointed two gentlemen to be a, um, a liaison between us and citizens to make sure we were vetted properly. 
And fortunately, um, when the next RFP came out, we won. Is that right? Yeah, because our paperwork didn't get lost. <laughs> and we, we had put the time, the energy, and the effort. Right. We had some of the best adjusters in the country. And I knew my daughter and my sons, they knew what they were doing. Uh, my, my daughter is, a, is an architect by trade. She's, a she's not a licensed architect, but she studied and got her degree in architecture at the University of Miami. My sons went to Grambling and University of South Florida. They did all the things. They got all the license um, um, in the adjusting, mm -hmm. you know, from flood to uh, property and casualty license. So we knew what we were doing. Over the years that we had been in the business, we had introduced ourselves to a number of people, I mean hundreds of people, and right now we have two or three hundred people that's on our roster right now ready to be deployed and it's just uh, waiting for the opportunity to introduce ourselves to companies um, to do some business with them. And we know what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing and right now we were fortunately eventually to get in Citizens and I would say they have one of the best rating programs mm -hmm. um, in the insurance industry because they modeled a lot of things from different companies. They took the best of everything. And we are rated consistently number one when they have their ratings every month. So Very and good. we use those guidelines to continue to train uh, our employees or our uh, 1099 uh, people that work directly with us. And how is that? Is it, it, are there other insurance companies now also involved? You know, since I've really been out of the loop since, you know, in, in those days. When is it better now? Is Citizens not the only, are there other carriers that are now insuring Florida? Oh no, there are a number of companies uh, that are looking to do business uh, in the state of Florida. Um, but as always, everybody wants to. Um, Until we have another active yeah. hurricane season. I mean, it's 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 going to happen. It's, we've been blessed over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think the last one we had was, I was think it was Irma, Irma. Like, yeah. uh, in 2017. Right, right. Um, yeah, thankfully. We've had a couple to come close. And I tell you what, by the grace of God, they missed us, you yeah. know, by 50 miles on one. And it's, it's just unbelievable how lucky we are in those situations. Yeah, I think. But it's gotten consistently better mm -hmm. uh, for Good. the insurance companies. Yeah, I see, you know, you it is it's horrific for wherever it ends up going but it, you you just uh, I, I think once you see kind of the results and what that can actually um, do to a community it, it's just devastating there was something I was at Mexico City I think in the Panama area where they were showing the one home that stood yeah. versus versus that entire community that that was once there and then, I mean all the businesses that are gone just everything that that is now gone and that could that could happen anywhere you know it could a, happen in, in anywhere home. and it could ha happen in a highly densely uh, dense uh, population area um, you just never know about those things and you have no control over them. Um, we're just fortunate that, that we're there. We have the people to put in place to help people because there's nothing better um, to have somebody come to your home to tell you it's going to be okay when you have that kind mm -hmm. of devastation in your lives. And we've seen it um, happen. We've been out there in those trenches when it happens and you know you, you see it happen all the time, and we just hope, hopefully, that you know we can not have it in our area. Right. But you it's work outside. One yeah, way or it's it's interesting. I will never forget preparing for Irma. I think it was the night before it was going to hit. I was at a CVS with some family members, and we were at uh, like Kennedy and Del Mabry, and all of us because uh, you know McDill's just south, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you see these tanks coming down Del Mabry Highway, you know, heading north on, and, and it, at that moment, you realize the seriousness of what we could be about to, to face. You know, it was just such an eerie feeling of now seeing these tanks coming down the street. Well, I think one of the good things our legislature has put together one of the best readiness teams in, in, in the country because of what Florida faces all the time, and they really prepare, but I think what, for the most part, when these weather people tell you to evacuate areas, right. people should heed those um, warnings and get out because you risk other people's lives right. when you don't Absolutely. get out in time. And you never know what's going to happen in those situations because um, I remember in, in 2004, and I, for whatever reason, I just ha happened to be watching ABC channel, uh, I think it was channel 11, and 
one of the what the weathermen, the, the main weatherman. Dennis man, Phillips. Sorry. Dennis Phillips. <laughs> yeah. It was Suspenders. it was headed to us. Mm -hmm. It was headed to to Tampa, and I had well, my family and I. We had sent them out. I had sent them out, and my son and I. We stayed back, and all of a sudden he said, "I don't. I can remember that just as vividly." Um, he said, you know what, this thing is going to change and it's not going to come to Tampa. And it took another route and went towards Orlando mm -hmm. area. And uh, I never will forget that. That's one thing that always stuck in my mind. So, but when they tell you to get out, right. you better get out. Well, I think it, as, as they've gotten, as, as we've seen, what was it? It was a Houston, I think, just a couple of years ago, right? When Absolutely. you saw the, the water and the flooding, uh, it's scary. I mean, you realize, I think that's another reason. So a lot of people think they'll write it out. But when water comes through and you never know, and we are such a low state anyway, low right. level, it's, um, you, just, you just don't know uh, and the we consequences were, We of were that. asked to be a part of that in Houston when they that storm came over there and I mean the devastation was un unbelievable it was you, mostly you, in the Corpus Christi area mm -hmm. and it was extremely uh, a lot of people you know got caught in the water and that's usually what what hurts people you know the surges from the water mm -hmm. comes in and um, because they didn't listen to the people when they told them to get out. And you walk you're working uh, it's not only in Florida so right you so you're all over absolutely, all over the absolutely. We mostly work the, the, the south, south eastern states because we just have better control, and most of our people are either in those Florida, Texas. One of the things that I wanted to do, and I kind of coincided with um, our company's uh, mantra was kind of coincided with Rick Scott when he first came in. He wanted to create 700,000 jobs, and that's one of the reasons I was able to get in his office. You know, adjusters are all over the country. What we were doing, we employed a number of Florida adjusters. So when they worked in Florida, the money stayed in Florida, mm. as opposed to bringing adjusters from all over the right. country when they may have an opportunity to help the people out. That money goes back. The money goes back with them, but with us, the money stays right mm. here in the state of Florida. That's and I remember relaying that to him, and maybe one of the reasons he <laughs> helped us out because yeah. we employed a lot of people like that. Well, th that's a great story. I'm glad to hear that he did help yeah. and that, you know, he, because that, um, at least you were able to get in then at that point. What advice would you share to other people, if, whether it's citizens or another company that they're trying to get into? You know, I guess perseverance. <laughs> Number one word is perseverance because right. it's, a, it's a tough business. And when you get in, you get an opportunity to prove yourself, um, do your best job, make sure you're doing everything correctly. Um, and for the most part, that's what we do. Um, but you, you gotta be able to survive. You gotta do things right. You gotta be upfront with people uh, and you gotta do it right. Absolutely. Well, let's talk, uh, let's touch on, uh, we talked about being inducted into the Ring of Honor. And, and, and the, you're, this, how, it's a, a limited group. And it, it, tell us a little bit about that and what that means. Well, it's something that, it means that you, you worked hard, everything that you did, you prepared well, um, you put everything you had into helping the team be successful. And f once you had an opportunity to perform, you always have to step up in certain situations. Um, football is a tough sport. When I played, I didn't catch many passes because they didn't throw me many passes. So when they did throw me you know, the passes that they did, I made sure that I caught them, <laughs> no matter where they were. You know, if you look at the website, there's some, a lot of catches. A lot of guys make a lot of great catches. Um, for me, and I'm, I'm, I'm really promoting myself in a sense that I like to see the younger players um, think about that because you know, I'm a big Jameis Winston fan, and I have to talk football when I talk about the Bucs. Um, a lot of the in interceptions that Jameis threw uh, last year, this was because he, the receivers weren't familiar, as familiar with him as they should have been. And they'll go deep into a route, and at the end of the route, they'll break it off. And he's already released the ball, and um, you just got to be on a – it's on a pace with the, right. you know, with the quarterback when you're doing that, and you can't afford to do that, and that's what I always tried to do. 
make sure that who, whoever my quarterback was, whether it was Doug, Steve Berg, Jack Thompson, you got to be on the same page. And when you get an opportunity to catch the football, you got to make some plays. You got to make something happen. Like in football, like in life, like in business, in right? Business. Right, right, yeah, all of it. In football, in life. Um, for the most part, that's, that's what I keyed on. And, um, you know, we had some very successful um, opportunities uh, with the Bucks. some things we couldn't control. Um, I think we had a chance to go to the Super Bowl in, 2000, in 1979. Um, we had a touchdown that was called back because of penalties. But, you know, it was just the destiny of the team. But we, what we did is showed everybody that we were winners. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though we didn't make but, you know, thirty to $40,000 that year. Right. Wow. <laughs> what? But what, it was fun. It yeah, was fun. I bet. And, that, and that's kind of like just what we said earlier in the show. I mean, it, it, you know, there's no regrets. I mean, it's just an experience. And it's made you who you are today. And Absolutely. It, and it, it kind of transformed you into this amazing man. What is your definition of success today? Well, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, success is, is when you are comfortable in life, uh, you've achieved some of the goals that you have had set out. And keep in mind, I've never really set out to be a Ring of Honor member or a Hall of Fame member, or, um, but I set out to do my best, work hard, and just become successful. Whatever that leads to, then it happens. And you take those same principles and you apply it to everything. Mm -hmm. um, whatever happens, if you do your best, if you work hard, if you study hard, uh, success will come. And at the end of the day, when you're comfortable with all of that and you're able to give back, like we started this program, it's a STEM program, at um, Town and Country Elementary um, with the principal and the assistant principal over there, Otis Kitchen. Um, what does STEM say? I, I was just actually writing up something on that. What does STEM sta stand for? It's science, That's okay. technology, engineering, and math. And these kids take all of this and they use computers, they use the Lego toys, and it teach them how to make those things move. And that's what you see in these science projects that these kids have. They're building rockets and spaceships at, at a young age. And it stimulates their brains so much that these kids can, they make these toys move and, and you know, Well, and plus it probably objects. sparks interest within them to, oh my to potentially you, follow certain passions. You uh, should the, see their faces yeah. when, they, when they achieve these things and they're lighting the faces light up, and we, we're just so excited to be a part of that um, because the kids are our future. And Absolutely. you got to give them those opportunities. And that's when you think you uh, have achieved some level of success when you're able to give back to, to the community in that regard. And in our program, we, we wanted to take this program. This is a pilot program for us. And um, we've had an opportunity to connect with some of the people at Google and Yahoo and we're putting this program together here in Tampa, and then we're gonna duplicate it in my hometown of Greenville, Mississippi, just to bring back, um, you know, to pay it forward in that situation. And all of these folks have agreed to um, use their time um, to help get the program started in, in uh, Greenville, Mississippi. And one of the, the other things that we do is the teachers spend a lot of time with these kids. <clears throat> from some of the donations that we receive and the funding um, that we receive in our foundation, which we started ourselves and we donated our own money to let people know that we're serious about this. We also, during the summer, we make sure the teachers are making a living wage so they can feel good at what they're doing. They're excited about helping these kids and um, we were able to bring them with the help of Brian Ford, uh, two games before the end of the year, we were able to put together a package. We brought about 25 teachers that are responsible for these kids to the game. And we were able to get them out there on the football field. And man, they were just so excited, the teachers and, and their spouses. And they were really 
uh, oh, excited I can about it. And we were ex just as excited as they were about that because that's when you think that you're yeah. doing something good and, and you're uh, being successful at helping people, making people smile. Absolutely. And feel comfortable about what they're doing. What is a website or where can, is it, you have a foundation or a website for the foundation? The website is uh, Jim and Vivian Giles Family Foundation, the website on that. At dot org? Dot com. Dot com, okay. Yeah. And uh, our website is jimmygiles.com. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's such so a So it's easy to remember. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and so ha thank you for doing what you're doing and your, 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 all of your involvement in the community. And I know we touched on this a little bit, but if you could go back, and one of my favorite questions to ask, if you could go back uh, right after college and give your younger self advice knowing what you know today. And I know we say no regrets, but right. what, what advice would you give your younger self knowing what you know now? I would probably have to say that I would probably go to law school. And if first, um, because I think knowing what I know now, if I had gone to law school initially and got my law degree, I still could have played professional football. Um, once I got my degree, if I had the opportunity. Yeah. Well, and you were obviously very athletically focused. I mean, to go, not, I mean, to be kind of start in, in baseball. And yeah. then, I mean, yeah. so. And was drafted by the Dodgers, um, but they had that thing that you call a curveball <laughs> that I had to work on. <laughs> but I was, I mean, you got to realize that everybody was so excited when I went to the Dodgers organization because you couldn't throw me a fastball. But they figured that out pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that the scouts were very serious about, and they brought me back um, during the spring, um, they realized that I had only played in 84 college baseball games in four years, where my counterparts had played in about four or 500 games oh my God. when they got drafted. I played in 84 games in college. These guys were in high school playing right. four and five hundred baseball games. So I was behind the eight ball when I went to college. I mean, when I went to the pros, but I wasn't going to let that hold me, you know, hold me up because I used to stay late, stay after practice. Right. The coach would work with me, and they worked with me on hitting the curveball. And it was going to happen if I hadn't chose to go back and play football. And I was fortunate <clears throat> that my college um, coach, Coach Marino Chasm. I mean, he was in my head during the, my season, my baseball season. Man, these scouts are calling for you. You got to come back. You got to come back. So we got one game before we played Grambling. My season was over. I went straight to college, back to college for, for my red shirt year, practiced one, um, one week, and started in the game <laughs> against Grambling. Uh, after I'd just come back from football. So I was the original Bo Jackson before. Right. You know, I was trying Bo to think Jackson. of his name, the one that yeah. was so versatile, <laughs> and, and I couldn't think of it, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, because that's not normal. I mean, it's, it, you're, you know, not everyone. Yeah. You typically, you kind of have one main thing you're, you're, you, you really excel at. Right. And, you know, to have multiple. Yeah, so I was a professional in baseball, and then I went back and played college. My senior, my, my redshirt year in college football. And then the next year, I got drafted in the third round by the Houston Oilers. Wow. Well, congratulations just on, on everything. What toughest lesson learned? Has there been, been kind of one thing that's been a tough lesson, like take away from it all? You know, I, have, I, I really don't have any. The things that I I've always remember is I tell people, listen to your parents. Um, if you have an uncle that's a parent figure, listen to them because they're not going to ever tell you anything that's wrong or that's going to hurt you. And I tell my kids that. Right. If I tell you something, think about it because I've been through it. You don't have to go through it if you don't have to. And I used to listen to my dad. If my dad told me something, I took it as a gospel. Yeah. 
And uh, it's I tough. live by that. It, it I because by that. I know you with my own children. I, I, I like whisper in their ear. I think I drive them crazy. But it's just like if you have no idea if you would just really listen to what I'm saying. I think they get. They, but at the end of the day, they have to. They have to. They have to follow right. their own paths. I get it. But we obviously, as but parents, want to save them. You can make it so much easier on yourself. Because that's just like us knowing what we know today and going back, right? Exactly. And having that exactly. opportunity to do it again. So us being able to share this. But but of course, until you come to, you, there's no way they can understand that. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I'll tell you a quick little story. <clears throat> and um, it ha actually happened to uh, involve my wife. Um, this We're just about out of time. So <laughs> 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 I told you it goes oh fast. My it goes so fast. Well, we were, my dad was at home. Police knocked on his door. He said, um, we got the description of this car. And the tag number said, this car just broke in a building in one of the little small cities. My dad said, no. My son is at school and he's probably in the dorm studying. Police gets on the phone, call our dorm. Now we got dorms at the time. You got one, hall, one phone on each right. end of the hall. They call me, the guys holler, Giles, come in, your, your dad's on the phone. I'm on, I, my dad asked me, had I been in Greenville, which was three and a half hours away, I'm in the room studying just like he said. Right. And that was one of the proudest moments of my life to be there because he knew where I was. He felt where I was because he knew that I was disciplined and I was always listening to what he was saying. Uh, yeah. And so the police just dismissed it and they weren't worried about it. Wow. But somebody had called it in and said I did something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That well, and like that kind of goes to what I mentioned earlier. You know, you were listening to those that were giving you right. advice, and you're following that. Jimmy, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story with us. I tell you, the time goes by you're fast. Really, you're <laughs> really very easy to speak with, and the time just flew. I mean, my thank goodness. Thank you so Where much. Well, we we have your website information on, so we'll definitely share that. Uh, definitely uh, check out EdgeBusinessMagazine.com. Subscribe to the magazine. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Uh, until next time, never stop dreaming. Thanks.